I believe I'm live. Ladies and gentlemen, things are a little uh, trickier here because we are connecting to all the studio uh, cameras and computer and so on going through the feed on my channel. So I guess we'll see how this thing is working. And it is working. Is it? Do you see us? Do you see us yet? All right. I see us. All right. I see my beautiful face. How's everyone doing? I see we got, uh, let's see who we got here. We got Warrior Woman. We got Fred Sanford. We got Nate2D2. Yeah. Got Gerard Perry. I Dimitri, just, Andrew Martin, what was that? I just want to apologize to uh, your fans because we have very sophisticated equipment here. Uh, David's channel cannot handle that. <laughs> Yeah, it is way, 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 way more sophisticated, um, and we're kind of uh, we're kind of learning how to uh, how to uh, how to use it with a with a YouTube channel as we go along. But uh, nope, this is uh, <clears throat> by popular request. By popular request, we've got a live stream at three o'clock because people who are in Europe they always complain when I go live at eight o'clock because it's the middle of the night for them, and so they complain. Yeah. And so they complain, say, why can't you do one earlier in the day? Well, we finally got one earlier in the day, three o'clock. We just wrapped up. We just finished. How many videos did we even finish? I think uh, I want to say about 14, give or take, probably. You mean today? Uh, today. And if we add everything, about 25, maybe. Yeah. So uh, so we did about 14, about 14 videos today. So that is a lot of videos, not counting the li Yeah. Well, and, and the live stream on your That's right. uh, Facebook, Facebook page earlier. Um, but yeah, so. Brain's kind of fried, but we're all done. We, we finished everything we wanted to record, and so thought it'd be cool to go live uh, here at the end. And after this, we're, we're taking off, right? That's right, man. So, Al, uh, tell us, uh, for people who do not know you, for people who are watching and um, uh, uh, haven't seen you before, don't know who you are, uh, for everyone who's, who's, who's watching, uh, the link to Al Fadi's uh, channel is in the description box. The videos that we recorded here today and yesterday, those are going on Al Fadi's channel, Sira International. So the link to his channel is in the description box. If you want to see those, and you probably do want to see those, then make sure you subscribe so that you'll you'll get those. But uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about your background? And, and I, I actually posted a couple years ago an interview with you on That's your right. testimony. So you can always look up, uh, you know, Al Fadi's testimony and get the longer version, but short version for people who uh, haven't seen you before. Yeah, thank you, of course, for inviting me to be on your channel. I'm honored here. And uh, thank you for all of you who are watching right now. Um, you know, maybe some of you know already, but if you don't, I am a former Muslim from Saudi Arabia. This is, by the way, why I dress up like this. This is my, my heritage. This is my cultural, uh, basically, uh, dress. I know sometimes people ask, why am I dressed up like this? As if this is connected, uh, uh, there is a connection between this dress and Muslims only. That's not the case. So I accepted Christ after a long journey of search, uh, basically, for the truth. In fact, uh, I grew up Muslim for almost 20 uh, uh, years until I went to uh, the U.S. And then 10 more years also after that, before I finally realized that I am not following the truth. And all that to say is that about 19 years ago, I became a believer in Christ. And uh, all of it because really uh, the testimony and also the, uh, the effort that was done by two families in particular, along with many others. In fact, in my days, there wasn't YouTube and I wasn't watching people like David Wood or anything like that. So you can imagine how difficult it would have been, you know, uh, for people at that time to try to share the truth with you and convince you that you're not the only uh, form of Muslim. Uh, there are others like you. So today it's much easier, honestly, to share with people. I was touched by their lifestyle, touched by their love, touched by the truth that they shared with me. And along with that, of course, the Holy Spirit was convicting me in my heart. And of course, reading and discovering that Christ that I knew is not the same as the Christ that I should follow. And that basically what uh, resulted in me after September 11, accepting Christ as Lord and Savior. And only 10 years ago that I became a full-time missionary and uh, in basically delved into apologetics. And we launched our ministry, Sierra International. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Rebecca Yee says, uh, your throats must be sore from all this recording. His, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it sucks because I've, I've actually got, a, uh, I've got a, a cold, which is horrible while, while, 
while I'm flying, right? Because I'll end up coughing and then everyone gives you dirty looks because they all think it's coronavirus and that I've just infected the whole plane. Um, well, actually, we went uh, through coronavirus, you know, not corona. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> coronavirus. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, uh, it, matter of fact, we were even uh, towards the end of the recordings. I was getting worse and worse and uh, having to kind of uh, we earlier we had to stop in the middle of a video because I couldn't uh, I couldn't stop hacking and coughing. Um, anyway, we are uh, we, we're we're we're, we're going to head to the airport in a little while. Uh, we thought it'd be cool to go live here. But uh, people are asking about the topic. Um I don't know if you mean the topic for the video series we were just working on or the topic for this show. For this show, we're just basically going to gonna go live with everyone for a little while, answer any questions people have. But as far as the, the series that we just recorded, yes. uh, what's the topic of, of, of that series? What were we talking about? Yes. Uh, you know, I it was probably uh, about a month ago when I approached David about this idea. And uh, knowing that he's a, a, formal, a former atheist and, of course, a follower of Christ, I felt like he will have a better handle on atheism than me trying to read on it and trying to do something about it. And the reason why is that there is a, I don't know if so many of you have heard this or even read about this, even BBC talked about it, that there is a lot of young Muslims who are gravitating towards atheism, declaring themselves to be ex-Muslims and atheists, which I don't know how that works, honestly, but it's, it's really intriguing to me. And I felt like as a former Muslim myself, he's a former atheist, both are followers of Christ, what if we talk about a topic related to Islam and atheism and contrast the two together and then bring in quotations uh, from experts who are either atheists or those who have basically raised objections against atheism like, uh, you know, Dr. William Lane Craig and so on and so forth. And that's pretty much the essence of this series that we did. We called it Islam and Atheism. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicholas uh, Paulson in the Super Chat says, here is a thank you for the earlier live stream from a European. God bless you all. Al Fadi and Dr. J. Smith's content uh, is always much appreciated. You're welcome. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you've you've been recording lots of stuff over the past couple of years with with J. Smith, right? Absolutely, and we're going to continue, of course, to unpack many of these uh, historical criticism uh, issues that deals with Islam. Yeah, dear dear dad, you were talking trash about about uh, Al Fadi. Uh, keep keep in mind, guys. You can usually you can usually get away with talking trash about me. I'm not I'm not sensitive. But if you talk trash about my guests and my friend who's on here, then I, I, I'm just blocking you. Sometimes I have a pretty uh, short fuse about um, something like that. Um, all right. So you, you see any questions you want to? Uh, somebody uh, Ty is saying, is this guy from Saudi Arabia? Yes, I am. Ty. Uh, now, now I worry uh, about why are you asking? So we'll see if there is a, uh, you know, a second comment. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> Frandell said, I don't think David really a tour Christian. <laughs> I'm not a tour Christian. What are you then? Well, I'm not a tour Christian. I don't know what sect that is. Uh, you want to retype that? <laughs> you want to retype that and say what you mean? Um, uh, Patrick says, hey, David, what about Muhammad plays Minecraft? Yeah, we haven't actually gotten. Guys, the videos where I really blast Muhammad, I usually do as retribution for Muslims doing something horrible, right? In, in other words, in other words, I, they don't seem to understand. I have no problem making fun of their prophet. Um, I don't make, you know, I don't make fun of their prophet as long as, you know, we're trying to get along and things like that. So after Nabil died, when people started sending me messages saying, um, you know, they, they were, I was getting all these messages saying, uh, seeking Jesus, finding cancer, right? So uh, playing a, you know, wordplay on his book title, seeking Jesus, finding cancer and stuff like that. Well, I got hundreds of those, probably, possibly thousands. Um, hundreds that I saw, possibly thousands more that I, that I didn't see because I don't read most comments. Um, but, you know, several months later, we get Islamicize me, right? So you guys want to, look, guys, it's, I have no problem blasting away at your, at your prophet. Um, but I kind of restrain myself when I'm trying to be on good terms with everyone. If you're just saying like the nastiest things you can, well, good. Then the next time I'm, I'm making videos about your, your fake prophet, I'm not going to, I'm not going to play nice anymore. And similarly, when, uh, after a long series of Muslims making debate rules and then completely breaking the rules, knowing that I, knowing that I will, I will keep the rules. I will honor the rules I've agreed to follow. And they completely break them. They go down the list and break everything they've agreed to. After that happened over and over and over again, well, guess what? You get Muhammad's boom, boom room. So, uh, 
Patrick here is talking about. I mentioned. Uh, I mentioned a while back we're going to do something like Muhammad plays Minecraft. So that's gonna that's gonna depend on someone doing something especially nasty. But I don't know if you've ever seen these gaming channels. We've seen these gaming channels where people are just people playing a video yep, game or something course, like that. Yeah, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have Muhammad playing video games. He's gonna play Minecraft, <laughs> right? So Muhammad's gonna play Minecraft or Fortnite or something like that, and uh, it, it'll just be it'll just be an actual video game. But my 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 sons uh, said that on Minecraft they can actually build a a boom a full boom boom room with explosives all all set up and stuff like that, and that there there can be dogs and there can be pigs, and maybe Muhammad's going around killing the pigs, and then the dogs all jump on him or something like that. And so they can right. set it up like that, but then we'll have like Muhammad playing. And yep. so that will be that will be retribution. So wait for someone to do something big and nasty or something like that, and then then we'll we'll get that. Yeah, leave it to David. Only mm -hmm. he can do that kind of stuff. That's why we all push the Muhammad stuff on David. Mm -hmm. So um, looks like we have a question, uh, at least for you. Can you go into detail about Muhammad's preaching three gods? And I, I will interject uh, my <clears throat> thoughts on that. I think I know what they're talking about. So go ahead. Uh, I'm a. I mean. I'm assuming they're talking about a lot Alusa Are they talking about yeah, the Yeah, they're talking about verses? the satanic verses probably. Yes. Okay, so uh, yeah, the story of the, the satanic verses, and, and I, I am up to 50 sources on this. I got 50 Muslim sources on the satanic verses. Yeah. And so the basic story, if you go back to the earliest versions of the story, here's the story. Um, Muhammad, uh, he really, really wanted his tribe to convert to Islam, but his tribe wasn't converting to Islam. They didn't believe him. They regarded him as a, as, a, as a fraud and as a lunatic. But he was hoping for a revelation that would reconcile him to his tribe. So one day he got the revelation he was looking for. He was receiving, a, he was receiving his everyday revelations. Um, and he got to the part where the Quran was supposed to say, Have you not heard of Alat, Alusa, and Manat, the third, the other? And right when he got to that part that Gabriel was revealing to him, Satan snuck in there. Satan snuck in there and revealed and added, these are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. Cranes in the sense of birds, not in the sense of, you know, machinery. So Alat, Alusa, and Manat were, were three pagan goddesses that Muhammad's tribe believed in. So he gets a revelation saying, have you not heard of Alat, Alusa, and Manat? These are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. So think about what this is saying, right? The, 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 the teaching was that they still, Muhammad still believed that Allah is the supreme God. And in fact, that was pretty common, even among the polytheists, to believe that Allah was the supreme God. So Muhammad believes that Allah is the supreme God, but what he granted as part of the Quran was that there are three goddesses that you can now pray to. And you could pray to them, not because they answer your prayers, but because they're the exalted cranes and uh, they carry your prayers to Allah. So you give your prayers to the birds, the birds carry your prayers to Allah. So Muhammad delivered this revelation. He bowed down in honor of the revelation, and then his followers bowed down with him. But here's the thing, unlike other revelations, because Muhammad would normally bow down and thank Allah for his revelations, and so would his followers. But this time, the pagans bowed down too. The pagans bowed down too and said, what an amazing teaching. He finally is praising our pagan goddesses. So, Muhammad was happy, his followers were happy, the pagan polytheists were all happy, everyone's happy because now Muhammad's promoting polytheism. Well, a little later, Muhammad comes back and says, sorry, the devil made me do it. The devil tricked me into revealing those verses and he came up with all sorts of justifications. He said, yeah, that, that happens with all prophets from time to time. That's Surah 22, verse 52 of the Quran, uh, where he says that this happens to all prophets from time to time, right? All prophets just accidentally give, uh, give revelations from the devil here and there. So that's what he had to say in order to justify this. Now, there are all kinds of problems with this. I mean, on the, on the obvious level, one, Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. Generally, if you're, if you're, if you're, Listening to a prophet, you want someone who can tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. Uh, two, Muslims uh, tell us that the, no one can imitate the Quran. The Quran is inimitable. It can't be imitated. Well, I mean, obviously, Muhammad should have been able to tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from someone else, but he couldn't, meaning the Quran can be imitated. So that's just a bunch of nonsense. Three, Muslims claim to respect uh, Moses. But according to Deuteronomy 18.20, Muhammad would have been stoned to death. Muhammad would have been stoned to death for delivering verses promoting polytheism. Um, so, yeah, this is just, there's just all kinds of problems. But, I mean, I don't know how you would trust someone after that. If someone's saying, I'm the last and greatest prophet and you believe in him, and all of a sudden, oops, I accidentally promoted polytheism. Notice that's shirk. 
Muslims, Muslims will tell us that Muhammad was sinless. And according to Islam, he committed the worst possible sin. He committed the, the sin of shirk. He promoted polytheism. So pretty rough. Right. And, you know, I want to add, uh, you know, some things for us. Uh, by the way, this, this incident, uh, you'll find at least the uh, revised verse in chapter 53, verses uh, 19 to 21. And you can read about this, by the way. Go to uh, David's uh, website, for instance, answeringmuslims.com. You can go to answering-islam.org. Uh, I, uh, you know, basically uh, spoke about it before. You can go to my Facebook, uh, basically, uh, page, alfadi.sira. All that to say is that here's the troubling part. How can a prophet does not distinguish between Satan and God speaking to him? That's that's really troubling. And the idea that, oops, I was I was duped by Satan because Satan duped every prophet before me, that's a lie. We don't find a single incident in the Bible that can prove that a single prophet sent by God was ever been duped by Satan. In fact, the Bible says that if a prophet says anything and claim that it is from God and it is not from God, worthy to be killed, basically. He's a lying prophet. All that to say is that if Satan fooled Muhammad once, then how many other times have he fooled him? How can we know that half of the Quran is not even from Satan? And that's, you know, that's uh, something important that for us uh, to talk about. Uh, I know that a couple of people are asking me, like Warrior Woman and uh, and someone else, Williams, I can't remember his name, uh, uh, Domfa. Uh, they're saying, you know, please uh, uh, explain to us what Sira stands for. I think I know why people get panicky when they see the term Sira. They think I am care, basically. Oh, care. I get Sira it. I get it. stands I get it. for the Center, the Center for Islamic Research and Awareness. And we basically use the acronym now, Sira International. Obviously, if you know anything about Islam, uh, Sira is the Arabic word for saying the biography of the Prophet. So I wanted to use a benign name to draw Muslims, not to offend them, basically. Now, the idea is I don't want to offend them because I don't want to lose them from coming to the site. I want them to come to the site. I want them to interact with us. And I want myself and my team and others to plant seeds. So that's what Sira stands for. Center for Islamic research and awareness. Mm -hmm. um, in the super chat, uh, John Kass said, uh, David, I guess you are familiar with Dr. Craig Considine. Time for a debate with him. Seems to be a leftist who wants to please, who wants to please Muslims. Um, as far as I know, Do Dr. Craig Considine will, would never in a million years debate me or anyone else who knows about Islam. Um, the, the, I don't know. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he's a uh, he's a Western intellectual who does who spends all his time praising Islam, uh, praising Muhammad. Uh, we 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 did it. We did shows way back. I mean, this must be this must have been like nine or ten years ago, where he he was he did this long article. I think it was in Huffington Post, comparing Muhammad to George Washington, arguing that Muhammad is basically the George Washington of the Middle East and so on. Wow. And so I actually dressed up like George Washington for that. I uh, uh, wanted to say, how to, in order to say how, how appalled yeah, I was. Only David Wood will do that. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, anyway, you can, you can if, if, if you think he would ever debate, you can go ahead and, and challenge him on my behalf or Sam Shamoon's behalf or anyone else's uh, who deals with this and, and say we would all be very, very, uh, we'd be thrilled to debate him. Um, but yeah, I think there's pretty much a 0% chance that this guy's going to debate anyone. It would kind of be the, the end of, of his charade. Right. So I'm going to, uh, somebody asked what kind of Muslim I was. I was a, uh, you can say I was Sunni Muslim, of course, but I was the extreme Sunni Muslim following the Wahhabi, basically, uh, uh reformed Islam, if you wish. So you have a movement like Wahhabi, for instance. Uh, it's based on Ibn Taymiyyah's teaching. Ibn Taymiyyah was, by the way, the teacher for Ibn Kathir, Salafi, if you wish. So Wahhabi, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Kathir, all of them are what we consider to be the Salafi movement, meaning it's based on 7th century Islam. Out of Wahhabi, by the way, we have what we call today Al-Qaeda, and out of them came ISIS. Wahhabi Muslim Brotherhoods, basically, they all sharing the same thing. Even though the Muslim Brotherhoods are more on the socialist side, they're still sharing the same kind of ideology. So I was following the extreme uh, form of Sunni, technically speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, David, I saw someone uh, making a comment that it seemed like, you know, people are not happy that you invest your time on Islam instead of sharing oh, yeah. the gospel with others, which is funny, really, you know, to when you think about it. Yeah, uh, guys, I, I noticed a problem years ago, and I'll go ahead and uh, I'll tell you what, I believe I even said this yesterday, but uh, 
I kind of learn as I go, right? I learn as I go. I learn about interacting with people as I go. Um, Nabil, I spent four years talking to Nabil Qureshi before Nabil became a Christian. Uh, probably two and a half of that, we focused on, we focused almost completely exclusively on uh, on Christian issues: the uh, death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, um, the reliability of the New Testament, and the divine nature of Jesus. So we we, we spent most of our time during the, those first few years uh, going over that, and eventually we turned towards Muslim issues like the uh, you know supposed miracles of the Quran or the life of Muhammad, things like that. Um, Nabil didn't become a Christian until after we really took a hard look at Islam. And, and he told me after he became a Christian that he was always thinking, even if we went through all the evidence, all the evidence for Jesus' death by crucifixion, and even if he thought we had really good evidence, he said, I was thinking to myself, you know, Christians actually have good evidence for what they believe. They have good reasons. They have a good case for what they believe. But you know what? Even if Christians could show me with 99% certainty that Christianity is true, I'm already 100% sure that Islam is true. So think about that. If you are presenting the gospel to Nabil Qureshi, if you are preaching the gospel to him, he would never, ever, ever, ever take you seriously because he is already 100% sure that Islam is true. What does this mean? Well, we have to ask ourselves, why are Muslims 100% sure that Islam is true? Because their heads have been filled with a bunch of lies. Right? They've been told Muhammad is the greatest man in all of history, and it's absolutely indisputable. Everyone agrees on it. They've been told that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. There's never been one single difference anywhere in any manuscript of the Quran. It's a miracle. They've been told that, that, that uh, the Quran and the Hadith are filled with scientific insights that people in Muhammad's time couldn't have possibly known. Things that are only being verified by scientists just now today. How is it possible that Muhammad knew, knew these things? They're told all of these things over and over and over again. And if you believe these things and don't question them, and you think they're true, then all you can conclude, all you can, c can conclude is, wow, Islam is indisputably true. And anyone who denies it is just ignorant or, or, or a deceiver. So Muslim, uh, Muslim heads have been filled with lies about their prophet and about their book. And for, the, for most of them, until those beliefs are corrected, until those lies are exposed, they're not going to take any preaching seriously. So you're saying, David, why are you, what you're really saying is, David, why are you spending so much time exposing all the lies that Muslims have been told in order that they may actually be able to take the gospel seriously once they realize that they've been told a bunch of lies? That's what you're asking. You're saying, David, why are you spending so much time showing Muslims that they shouldn't have 100% confidence in Islam because they've actually been told a bunch of lies? You're saying, why, why are you spending all that time, David? Why are you spending all that time getting them into a position, into a state where they could actually take the gospel seriously. Shame on you, David. Shame on you. So anyway, yeah. all right. Uh, good, good answer, of course. And, uh, and by the way, some people are asking, like, why is David focused on this and not that? You know, God gives us gifting, by the way, and God calls us to do certain things. Paul wanted to go to the Jews. He's a Jew, by the way. He felt like it will be so easy for me to go on reason with the Jews. And the Lord prevented him from doing that, and he called him to the Gentiles. So we have to really be obedient to the calling. Now, uh, someone was asking you, and i like to at least address that first, and maybe you can elaborate that. Rick uh, Anders uh, is saying, you know, how do you, uh, as Christians, how do we treat Muslims at the workplace? And that's an excellent question, by the way. Do we treat them as pariahs, you know, or, or do, we, do we like uh, basically them as normal workers with promotions and everything? So let me say this. First of all, uh, workplace is a perfect evangelism field, by the way. God created you and them in his image. So we cannot really judge people just because they decided not to follow the God that we know. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, incumbent upon us to share the truth with them. And you need to pray for the right opportunity. Now, I know some workplaces may uh, prevent you from sharing it at the workplace, but hopefully that will be the beginning of building a relationship that you can go to a coffee shop, invite them to your home, go visit with them, and begin to share the truth. It's your attitude and how you live sometimes can open the door for people to ask you, why are you different, for instance? And remember, uh, you know, God basically is in the business of moving people around, bringing him from one area to the other. So if you have co-workers who are Muslim from India, from Pakistan, from Saudi, whatever the case might be, God has a plan for them. Acts 17, 26 and 27 tells us that. And there is three parts of that plan that they, these people that he's bringing in contact with you, in this case Muslims, that they may seek him 
in hope that they may grope for him or touch him, feel him basically, or feel their way, their way towards him. And the third one is find him. Um, just wanted to give a couple shout outs here. I don't want to miss anyone in the uh, Super Chat and Super Stickers. Uh, LaGray77, thank you for the Super Sticker. Hexatas in the Super Chat says, Yusuf Estes started Islam in Beijing in 400 BC. Did you know that? Yusuf Estes? Is, is this the guy started again, Islam in Beijing? No, 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 no. This is Hexa. <laughs> so look, you you he thought he thought he thought you're actually the Muslim from, from yesterday who was saying that there were four there were four hundred gospels four hundred years before Christ, and by the time of Christ it was it was narrowed down to four. That the four that Yeah, it have. was me, so he brought me on the studio to uh, deal with it. Yeah, this is no this is Hexatas uh, <laughs> this is Hexatas making fun of Yusuf Estes, who said that oh, yeah, yeah. the uh, who, who was a popular Muslim speaker, but he, he we, we we saw a video clip of him the other day saying that um, the Catholic Church was started three centuries before Christ by Alexander the Great in Rome. And uh, there an are amazing. so many, yeah, there are so many problems with that, uh, <laughs> that it, it boggles the mind. Uh, but Muslims just don't call him out for saying those the kind of ridiculous things. Uh, Liger System says, Act 17 apologetics, do, do Muhammad's literal physical worldview on Minecraft, complete with puppies in hell and bulls and whales. So uh, uh, here Liger System is talking about the picture of the universe that we get. Uh, when we read the Muslim sources. And basically, in, in short, you know, you, you've got some things down at the bottom and then you eventually got uh, this giant fish or whale. And then on top of the, the fish or whale, you have seven earths that are all stacked up like pancakes. And uh, that, that's why you get earthquakes because that whale will eventually get agitated and shake around. That's where you get earthquakes. Um, and then you've got the, 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 the top earth, the seventh earth, that's our earth. And it's flat too. And the sun goes down into a pool on that, on, on our earth. So it's much smaller than the earth itself. Uh, and then above that, you have these you have these these domes, and within the within the the the, the first dome is uh, is are, are the stars, and the stars are there as missiles uh, for that Allah uses to shoot demons when they try to sneak up uh, in, into His heaven. So that's what the stars are; they're missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons. And then so you go through these uh, these sort of seven domes, and they're all solid; they're all solid. They would fall on us if if Allah didn't hold them up. And you get to the to the top, and you you have these uh, eight giant mountain goats, and above all that, you have a sea, and then uh, and then the throne of Allah. So, uh, Liger system is saying, do that in Minecraft, because in Minecraft you can build you can you can build things and stuff. And he's saying, I, I might have to give I I'd never played Minecraft once in my life, uh, but I I might have to give my kids a, a description and say, hey, can you build that? Um, I might have to pay them some money though. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> So um, it, it seemed like we have a question. Maybe both of us will address it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Samba is saying, what is your response when Muslims say the Bible is corrupted and that we cannot <clears throat> know authors? Obviously, I can speak from my own experience, of course, as a, a former Muslim. Of course, I always thought the Bible is corrupt. Now, here's the problem. If a Muslim brings to you the four passages found in the Quran, for instance, like chapter 2, verses 75 to 79 is an example of that. In chapter 3, there's another one and so on and so forth. The funny part is that when you read it, it doesn't really say the Bible as a book is corrupt, nor that it says that Christians and Jews have corrupted. It says that a party of them, and sometimes it's the Jews, sometimes the people of the book, and then it appeals to the rest of the group that they are better than these ones. That's number one. Number two, I mean, I will tell the Muslim if he's really sincere and asking a question that uh, requires an answer uh, without mocking me or making fun of me, show us a proof. We have thousands of manuscript evidence to prove that the Bible in our hand today is the same Bible that existed at the time of Muhammad, before the time of Muhammad, and even before the time of Christ. You know, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls is an amazing discovery. And we have thousands of these manuscripts and fragments also that the study Bibles will tell you. You know, earlier manuscripts will say this and this and this. So we do have a way to trace it back, technically speaking. And the other thing is I did an entire series on defending the Bible just from the Quran alone. You can go to basically our YouTube channel and watch that. You know, it's uh, the YouTube channel, Sira International. And I showed that the Quran uh, basically holds the Bible at a higher level. It respects the Bible. It quotes from the Bible. It says that the Bible was revealed by Allah, the God of Islam. So I'm really confused. Why do Muslims say the Bible is corrupt if their Allah actually never said it, nor that their prophet ever said something like that? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and uh, oh, before I go, um, before I uh, before I get started here, uh, believing thinkers, uh, shout out in the super chat said, "Keep up the good fight, brothers." Um, yeah, I would, I would. Uh, the reason this is important, 
uh, Al Fadi is uh, back when I was having discussions with Nabil and I didn't know what the Muslim sources say about the scriptures of Jews and Christians, the natural inclination for Christians, even Christians who study apologetics, when someone says your Bible's been corrupted, is to start doing textual criticism, right? To start going through, uh, you know, start showing, uh, you know, the manuscripts of the Bible and how experts agree that the Bible is the best, uh, best preserved book of the ancient world and so on. Um, not realizing that the Muslim objection to the Bible, the Muslim claim that the Bible has been corrupted, has nothing to do with examining the manuscripts, right? They, they have nothing. They, these guys didn't go out and, and examine Greek manuscripts to determine that the Bible's been corrupted. It had nothing to do with them. Muslims claim that the Bible's been corrupted because, one, they understand that the Quran affirms the inspiration of the Jewish and Christian scriptures. They understand that. They know that, they know that part that the Quran affirms that Allah inspired our books. If you don't, if you don't know uh, where this is, Surah 3, verses 3 to 4, talks about Allah inspiring, uh, Allah revealing the Torah and the Gospel. So, they understand at least that part. Um, but they also understand that our scriptures don't line up with theirs, right? The, the, the Bible talks about the, the, the death, resurrection, and deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't line up with Islam. They understand that, right? Uh, so, Muhammad, according to the Bible, is a false prophet. Well, if the Bible was inspired by Allah, but the Bible, uh, the Bible condemns Muhammad, you're, there are two possible conclusions. One, Muhammad's a deceiver. He didn't know what he's talking about. Or two, the Bible's been corrupted. So they, they don't want to say Muhammad's a false prophet, so they go with the Bible's been corrupted. Problem is, as, as Al-Fadi pointed out, that's not what the Quran says. The Quran does not say our scriptures have been corrupted. If you want the, if you want the references, Surah 3, verses 3 to 4, talks about the inspiration of the Torah and the Gospel. Um, Surah 7, verse 157, says that Jews and Christians still had the Torah and the Gospel during the time of Muhammad. Why is this relevant? Well, we have copies of the Torah and the Gospel before the time of Muhammad, and so we know what the Torah and the Gospel during the time of Muhammad said. And so you can't say, in other words, you can't say it was corrupted during the time of Muhammad. Allah is affirming that they still had it, right? So, we know that Jews and Christians still had it, but Muhammad's, Muhammad's preaching, Muhammad's preaching in the seventh century. He's preaching in the seventh century. So that means that the Torah and the gospel had been reliably preserved all the way down to the seventh century. So, if you want to say it's been corrupted, you'd have to say it was corrupted after that. Too bad we got copies of it before that, right? Uh, Surah 6, verse 115, and Surah 18, verse 27, both claim that no one can change or alter or corrupt Allah's words. And again, Surah 3, verses 3 to 4, declare that the Torah and the gospel are Allah's words. So if a Muslim says your book's been corrupted, I say, wow, you just told Allah, said that Allah is a liar. Uh, you can keep going. Uh, Surah 5, verse 43, talking about the Torah, uh, in, in the historical background of the situation is that Jews came to Muhammad to settle a dispute. And Allah's response to Muhammad was, why are the Jews coming to you when they have the Torah? Exactly. So notice, Muslims are saying, oh, you Jews and Christians, you need our book because your book has been corrupted. Allah says you don't need Muhammad because you have a book, because you have a reliable book. Right. So Muslims today say the exact opposite of what their God says, and they don't see any problem with this. So that's chapter 5, verse 43. Go a few verses later. Now it's talking about Christians and their book. Chapter 5, verse 47 of the Quran, Allah says, Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. If any fail to judge by the light of what Allah has revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. The Quran calls us rebels if we don't judge by the gospel. Exactly. What do Muslims tell us? Don't judge by the gospel, it's corrupted. So they're telling us to rebel against Allah. Okay. Allah says, that's the book you Christians are supposed to judge by. That's the book you Jews are supposed to judge by. And then Muslims come along and say, don't judge by either of those books, only judge by the Quran. Right? Uh, so that's chapter 5, verse 47. You go to chapter 5, verse 68, where Allah says that the people of the book, Jews and Christians, have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to us. So that makes no sense if our book's been corrupted, right? It makes no sense. So here's the idea. Uh, yes, you can, go to, you, you can go to textual criticism. Yes, you can get books on the, on the history of the Bible and, and defend it that way. If you're talking to a Muslim who challenges the... Uh, who challenges uh, the Bible by saying that, you know, it's been corrupted, then you're, you're basically pointing out, look, you're telling us that Allah is completely ignorant. You're telling us the Bible's been corrupted, but your God and your prophet didn't know it. Your God and your prophet completely pray, do nothing but praise our book and command us to judge by it. You're telling us it's been corrupted. You're saying you know better than Allah and Muhammad. So you know better than God and his prophet. 
Well, that means your, your God and your prophet are not the real God or a real prophet because you know more than they do, right? So that's how, that's how I would answer. Absolutely. I mean, and not only that, but in the same context that David just mentioned, chapter 5, verses 42 to 48, the Quran quoted from the Old Testament, actually. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and that's extremely important. Let's see. It looks like there, you have a question. David, since you spend so much time <coughs> dealing with Islam, do you manage to also find the time to keep up with the most current literature on philosophy of religion? Um, no. There, is, there you go, your answer. Yeah, so uh, basically, as of the time of my doctoral dissertation, I was pretty up to date. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm up to date on all the like classic works, right? I, I read the classic works in, in philosophy of religion. Um, as of the time I completed my uh, doctoral thesis, I was completely up to date on the problem of evil, meaning I knew all the arguments all the way up until then. Since then, I've been dealing with Islam. So anything that's that's happened in the last, you know, uh, I don't know how many years uh, since since I got that, uh, I've read very little since then. So no, definitely not up to date. Uh, Nathan Wiggins says, "Hello, David. I am having lunch this Saturday with a Muslim. First formal meeting. What are some tips to help with the conversation? What thoughts do you have?" Well, I mean, it, it all depends on the Muslim, their attitude, uh, their background, uh, how open they are or not, and all that kind of stuff. So I would say the best thing for you, for, bring up, for instance, the topic about Ramadan. It's it's right around the corner and uh, Eid and celebration. In fact, talk about the impact of coronavirus on people visiting Mecca right now. I mean, if Islam is a religion of works, how is that going to impact it? And just kind of be curious, ask questions about what do you believe in? You know, why do you have to do this? And, and so on and so forth. So I would say open the door this way and then back it up right away and say, oh, you know what? In, in the Bible does talk about fasting. The Bible does talk about praying this way. In our case, we can pray at any time. Uh, so I don't have to worry, for instance, about coronavirus shutting down the church, for instance, and so on and so forth. I would say be, uh, you know, creative in finding ways to build bridges, but focus on the gospel, focus on Christ, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I, I would add... Uh, especially for uh, initial encounters like that, focus on asking lots of questions, right? Um, I, I usually I usually break it down like this. Uh, I, I say, start off with kind of uh, what I call what questions, right? What do you believe? Um, what do you believe about God? What do you believe about uh, Muhammad? What do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? Uh, because lots of people are, are, you know, pretty comfortable answering questions about w- what they believe. And, uh, you know, so, so it's gonna, the Muslim is going to be pretty comfortable answering questions about uh, what he believes. And, but after a while of asking these sort of what questions, it would transition to some uh, what I would call why questions, right? So not just what do you believe about this, but why do you believe that? So why do you believe that about God? Why do you believe that? about uh, Muhammad? Why do you believe that about the Quran? Why do you believe that about the Bible? Why do you believe that about Jesus? And start taking note of this person's reasons. Now you're not just getting this person's beliefs, you're getting this person's reasons for believing. So here you'll find any particular arguments that this person has found persuasive um, about Islam. And so you start getting this person's reasons. And depending on how the conversation is going, you might want to want to keep going uh, from there. But, uh, you know, if, if you've been going at that a while and you know that you'll be able to meet with this person again, uh, usually I would say, hey, you know, thank you for uh, for sharing your, your reasons for believing. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to, to look into uh, some of those reasons that you gave and see, uh, you know, look into them for myself. Would you mind getting back with me, uh, you know, a week from now so that we can actually look through some of this uh, together and you can answer any more questions I have? Lots of Muslims would be thrilled. I mean, think, if, if, if a Muslim were saying that to you, hey, you know, I thought about what you said and I'd like to meet again. I mean, lot, Christians would be thrilled at, at that opportunity. Well, guess what? Muslim, Muslims are like that too. So, um, yeah, I, I would kind of do it like that. And then the idea there is, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how much studying you've done in Islam. You, you, may, you may be a, an expert or you may, you know, this, this may be kind of new to you. But uh, if you are, um, if you are, you know, assuming you don't you don't know everything and you you haven't studied every possible issue, then what it allows you to do if you if you start by asking questions and you get this person's personal reasons for uh, particular reasons for Islam, and it allows you to just go focus on those and just to study those, 
And so it, it sort of narrows the amount of studying you have to do. And so then I would go, I would study those issues. If the person says, you know, scientific miracles or the Quran's perfect preservation or the greatness of Muhammad, um, and then come back, set up another meeting and then come back. And then at, at, at that meeting, at that meeting, you know, you, you may be tempted to start blasting away, but you can get information across by asking more questions, even if it was sensitive stuff. You know, even if the person said, because of the greatness of Muhammad and his perfect character, um, I, I believe that Islam is true. Even if the person did that and you'd be inclined to start, you know, blasting away with Muhammad and Aisha and things like that, you can do that in a, in a gentler way. So you can even bring up a sensitive topic by saying, Instead of saying, hey, your prophet's a pedophile or something like that, you can do that in a gentler way by saying, hey, you, you told me that, you know, you believe Muhammad is a perfect man. Uh, I, I was looking up some stuff and I found this article on, on Muhammad and his relationship with Aisha. And it looks like the Muslim sources say that she was nine years old. Um, that, that would be weird, you know, by, by our standards. I was wondering how you would interpret that. And I wouldn't put too much pressure on them and say, hey, maybe you could take this article and, you know, maybe you could read this and then get back to me and give me your response as a Muslim. And then, you know, hopefully that person actually... So no, notice, it's very different from, you know, blasting away at someone in a, in a conversation if you want to keep the conversation going. Uh, that's very different from asking for information, asking for the other person's perspective. Lots of Muslims, even on a sensitive issue, if you ask for their perspective, um, lots of times they will. They will look into it uh, to try and give you a, a good response. So so those are those are my thoughts. Use lots of questions and stuff that... that uh, yeah, uh, Isaac Marshall says, uh, Acts 17 Apologetics sounds like the Columbo tactic from the book of the same name. Uh, and yeah, that, that's that's part of the reason, I don't know if everyone noticed, but earlier this year, um, I I plugged uh, I plugged Greg Kokel's book, Tactics. And part of it was, he kind he had a very similar method. We describe, we describe it differently, and we kind of focus on a couple of different things. But uh, we both had kind of the same method in terms of starting off with lots of questions. And so that's why I recommended the book because, guys, it's, it's very easy to go into a conversation and just start proclaiming what you want to proclaim and, and, and attacking where you want to attack. And that's kind of, there are situations where you would want to do that. But if you're trying to keep a conversation going with someone you just met, it's just you're much more likely to do that if you're asking lots of questions because, you know, people, if you're, if you're blasting away, uh, that's going to make that that will generally make someone feel uncomfortable. Whereas if you're asking questions, that that generally makes people feel comfortable. So uh, if you want to keep things going, then then that's a better route to go. Okay. All right. Do we have anything? Uh, looks like somebody is saying, is there any good reasons to believe Jesus claimed to be God from? I'm not so sure what that means. From God or God? I mean, let's let's assume the question is, he claimed to be God. Of course he claimed to be God. In, in many ways, Jesus claimed to be God. I mean, David yesterday mentioned an excellent example. It's one of my favorite, actually. He said, used the example of the trial during, uh, you know, before the crucifixion in Mark chapter 14, verses 61 to 64, where the high priest was asking Jesus, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Most High, or the Son of the Living God? And the answer was, I am. Notice, he didn't say, I'm not. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the majesty and coming in the clouds of heaven. I mean, Jesus even added a third title for himself. And the Son of Man is the divine Son of Man of Daniel chapter 7, for instance. And uh, the Christ, Jesus himself, says that the Christ is divine when he was debating with the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 to 44, when he says, whose son, notice, whose son is the Christ? And they said, he's the descendant of David. He says that, how come David, by the Spirit, says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand. If call, David calls him, uh, basically, Lord, how can he be his son? Notice, he's, he's referring to himself. Jesus identified himself as the Christ by saying, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. John 17, 3. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Of course, he's called the Word of God. In the beginning, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. I mean, so many passages actually show that Jesus clearly was aware of who he was. I and the Father are one. No one can snatch him out of my hands, speaking about his followers. I mean, the list can go on and on and on. I mean, you can, you're can. you welcome to add anything. Uh, no, I mean, if, if they if they want a discussion of the, the uh, claims of Jesus, then uh, I've already made a video uh, titled, Where Did Jesus God Worship Me? So if you want to type in, Where Did Jesus God Worship Me? Um, you can get uh, plenty of material there. Um, 
a couple super chats here. Um, Michael SSJ2 said, uh, hi, David and Al-Fadi. I'm a Christian and I work with my manager who is a Muslim. We get on really well. I don't know how to talk about Christ in work. Well, this would actually be connected to what we were just talking about as far as starting a conversation. As far as starting a conversation, I think Christians think this is more difficult than it actually is. Maybe you can verify. Lots of Muslims would be thrilled to talk to you about Islam. Of course. Is that true? If, if you find the right way to ask him, of course. Yeah. So we, we think we think in the West a lot of times there are certain topics you don't bring up because you're just going to hurt everyone's feelings and so on. Uh, most Muslims come from a culture where you, you love to talk about everything all the time, right? So, uh, and it's not just that. So... If you think about it, there's a couple of things here. One, culturally, lots of Muslims are, are very comfortable talking about these things. Uh, two, um, your, your Muslim manager, if he takes his, his religion at all seriously, believes that you are on a wrong path. The Quran, chapter 16, verse 125, commands Muslims to invite everyone to the way of Islam. So his religion, in his religion, he's actually encouraged to uh, set you on the right path. And Muslims who actually are able to share Islam with others are, are esteemed and praised in Islam. So lots of Muslims would love to actually talk to you about Islam. But third, your average Muslim believes that your view of Islam has been distorted by the media and through all the terrorist attacks. And so they would love to tell you about Islam. That they would love to tell you that ISIS doesn't represent their religion. They would love to tell you these things, but they're they're kind of they're kind of worried that they might upset you if they if they bring these things up. And so, uh, what you have to do here, all you have to do here is is just uh, open the door, right? You don't you don't have to you don't have to run up and say, hey, I want the conversation started. An easier way to do that, knowing that if this person takes his religion at all seriously, he would love to talk to you about. Islam. An easier way to do this is just is just open the door. Just give him some sort of opening. And you do this just by saying, uh, hey, I, I know I know that you're a Muslim and uh, I'm not here to start an argument, but, um, you know, I, I, I've, you know, I, I've heard some about Islam. I've read a little bit. I've read some articles. I've, I've seen a lot in the news. And I'm just wondering, uh, uh, could you tell me what 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 you believe? And that shows an interest in what this other person, you just gave him the open door that he's probably looking for, right? Uh, if he's your manager, he probably is worried. Oh, if I start if I start preaching to this person or something like that, uh, then I might get in trouble or something like that. He might might be worried about. It. But if you're the one asking the question now, great! I have an opportunity to talk to this person about Islam and to show that Islam is a religion of peace and that Islam is wonderful and that Muhammad is a true prophet. Blah 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 blah. So just giving that person the opportunity usually uh, you, usually works. And then the conversation is going to start. And then go back to what we said before. Now now start asking questions. What do you believe about this? What do you believe about that? Eventually transition into some why questions. Why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? Now you've got the person's reasons. Now, hey, could we talk about this again? I would like to look into some of these reasons. And then, and then you're going from there. Because when the person gives his reasons and his beliefs, when he gives his reasons for believing certain things about Jesus, notice, notice he's going to be, he's going to be giving critiques of Christianity. So then when you're getting back together, notice you've just opened the door for the gospel because, hey, he's the one who said, he's the one who said Jesus was just a prophet or that Jesus didn't die by crucifixion. Now, when you go back and you said, hey, you told me you believe this. I was just wondering because I found this evidence. Now, all of a sudden you're, pre you're presenting the gospel. See, so that's how, I, that's how I'd roll with that. Uh, any more thoughts on that one? No, I think uh, that's an excellent way to uh, talk about it, basically. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's how we need to really address, uh, basically, uh, the gospel with people. Uh, Muslims, by the way, get very interested. If you ask them questions, they think like you're interested in Islam, technically speaking. Mm -hmm. um, Dom Fah said uh, in the super chat, David, I'm just curious, what does the Quran get right? Well, the only things the Quran gets right are th the things that it stole from other sources that... It, it, it got lucky on, right? So Muhammad's stealing things from all sorts of different sources, Jewish sources, uh, Christian sources, heretical Christian sources, uh, pagans. Muhammad's just getting all kinds of stories from all around him. Well, guess what? Some, some, sometimes those stories are true. He's stealing a story that's true. Other times he's, he's, he's stealing a story that's basically a bedtime story. Muhammad couldn't tell the difference. So the things that Muhammad got right are the things that he just got lucky with, right? Like if I just, if I announced to everyone around me, hey, everyone tell me a story. And then I copy all those down and I say, here, this is my, this is my, my new religion. Well, some people will have told me true stories and some people have told me false stories. And so there, there will be some uh, correct stories yep. in there. Uh, Vince, uh, you're saying, Al and David, please talk about the literary proofs of the uh, 
uh, plagiarization of the Quran. I tell you what, me and Jay are going to do an entire series about portions of the Quran that were borrowed from other sources. But David, have you done anything on that? Um, yeah, yeah, I brought that up in, in various debates and so on, where you can actually, I mean, but you can do it in much more depth. In fact, uh, Islam critiqued has been going into much more detail, right? Because I, I go over the basics of, you know, where this, uh, you know, where the story about, uh, you know, Jesus giving life to clay birds or Jesus speaking at birth, those are pretty easy to trace, but... Um, Islam uh, critique Isla will give you references, actually. Is Islam critiqued, he's going into much more, you know, with, with the story of the Queen of Sheba and stuff exactly. like that. He's going into much more detail about all these sort of uh, background and the Jewish sources and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, follow Islam Critique's channel and... Yeah. Yeah. And me and Jay are going to do something about that as well. So uh, uh, you can uh, have that uh, that too. Um, I'm looking just to see... Uh, oh, okay, so I, I, there's a funny question. Uh, Adel is saying, Al-Fadi, is there another true religion beside yours? I don't even know what that question is. There is no religion here. We follow Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Unless if I'm misunderstanding your question, uh, we're not promoting religion. We're promoting the truth here. And there is only one way to heaven. So if the, your question is, is uh, there any other way to heaven beside Jesus? The answer is no. Um, Ty just asked, does Al-Fadi have a YouTube channel? Yes, Ty um, and everyone else who's here. Uh, Al-Fadi has a YouTube channel. The link is in the description box. Um, he posts a ton of content. Um, he very often gets uh, people like me or Sam Shamoon or Jay Smith or uh, Anthony Rogers down. He'll uh, just, that's what we've been doing for the past two days here. We record a ton of videos and then he releases them on his channel. So if you want to check those out, again, the link is in the description box. Yeah. So there is Davis Amos is really uh, urgently asking you about your opinion of Mormonism because he, he's been sending questions about that uh, all day long now. So, uh, Well, I, I mean, I believe it's false. Of uh, course. I don't, I don't believe I mean, Joseph Smith was a true prophet. Um, I don't believe there's any reason to believe in Joseph Smith. I believe his whole case collapses. The reason I don't talk about Mormonism is because I don't study it, right? So notice everyone. I generally don't talk about stuff unless I study it, right? There are, there are plenty of people in the world who are ha frequently on these, on these, uh, in these discussion, uh, lots of Muslims, lots of Muslims who want to tell us all about the Bible and Jesus and all about uh, their own religion, clearly have never studied any of it, right? They haven't studied their own religion. They haven't studied our religion. They just, but they, they, they just continue to say stuff over and over again, right? Um, yeah, I'm not like that. So as far as something like Mormonism, uh, there, there are people frequently ex ex Mormons who study Mormonism, so they're Christian apologists who deal with Mormonism. So I would generally let them uh, let them deal with that. Absolutely. I mean, I can tell you as a former Muslim myself, uh, you'll be surprised uh, how much of an overlap is there between Mormonism and Muhammad, basically, and Islam. And, and again, I'll leave it like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jan Cass asked uh, in the super chat, anyone else has anyone else come to your come to faith in your family, Al Fadi, or is that is that classified? Uh, come, come to where? Has anyone else in your family come to faith, or um, is that is that classified? Well, I mean, I do have members of my immediate family did, but uh, my my uh, you know the extended family no. Uh, my mother is not a believer, uh, so I can tell you that much. Uh, my father is not a believer. I can tell you that much. So, uh, but there are certain members of my family who have accepted faith, but uh, that doesn't mean uh, I am off the hook. Uh, that doesn't mean I am not hated by some. Um, doesn't mean that I'm rejected, uh, not rejected, and so on and so forth. But we praise the Lord. I mean, this is this is the cost that comes with following Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, Selko says, uh, "Hello, David. Hello, Alfadi. Uh, David, you made a video a while back called Who Killed Muhammad.' Can you remind us how Allah killed Muhammad? God bless." <laughs> So, uh, Selko, your followers are funny, by the way. Yeah, Selko's referring to uh, a video I made a while back. You can you can all watch that. that that's kind of a that's a kind of a classic video. Um, the, uh, the the video who killed Muhammad, and so uh, it's I think it's got it's got between one one million and two million views. But basically, it's uh, if you read the Quran, there there's a passage in uh, Surah sixty nine. I think it's forty four verses forty four to forty six. Um, but there's a passage there where Allah says that if Muhammad were to invent a revelation and pass it off as a revelation from Allah, he would sever his aorta. And so 
this is part of the Quran. Muhammad and his followers, they memorize this, memorize it saying, yes, if Muhammad were to invent a false revelation, he would, uh, Allah would sever his aorta. Well, interestingly, several years later, Muhammad died saying that he could feel his aorta being severed. Right, so uh, anyway, you put those things together, you put those things together and you get, a, you get some, some interesting conclusions. So anyway, I got the, that video, Who Killed Muhammad, where I go through, um, I, go, I, go, I think I go through 10, uh, I think I go through 10 issues, 10 different ways we can know that Muhammad's a false prophet based on this, uh, based on this whole story. But uh, yeah, classic video. That's actually one. I look at some of my old videos, some of my older videos, and I was using a pretty, a pretty garbage camera, right? I'd be using a garbage camera with a garbage microphone or no microphone. I don't think I was using any microphone in, in, in that one. Uh, so it's just the, the, my camcorder in my room with all sorts of horrible background noise. So bad resolution, bad audio. And I make a video and I get, you know, over a million views on it. But some of those earlier videos that I really like the topic, thinking about actually like re-recording some of those in 4K with, you know, an awesome microphone to, uh, and kind of re-releasing them uh, after yeah, all these years. That's awesome. That's awesome. Why not? Um, <laughs> uh, Turb, Turb in the super chat says, Allah prays for Muhammad, not to Muhammad. Just so you know, Allah prays for does, Muhammad. Does it not make to a Muhammad. difference? Does it really make no, a he's, difference? He's, make, he's making fun of Muhammad Hijab there. So, uh, oh, yeah. I yeah see. In a debate, I said, uh, I said, according to the Quran, Allah prays for Muhammad. And he said, uh, he, he, Muhammad Hijab jumped up and he said, I have to correct David's Arabic. I'm giving him a free Arabic lesson. All the Muslims are cheering. He goes, Allah doesn't pray to Muhammad. He prays for Muhammad, which is exactly what I said. And the Muslims cheer. The Muslims cheer for him saying that Allah prays for Muhammad, which is exactly what I said. He claimed to be refuting me on, and he agreed with me, and he's admitting that Allah prays. And the Muslims are cheering. Yay. He, the b bottom line is, as long as you say it, in the, as long as you're the Muslim debater, as long as you say it in the right voice with the right exactly. intonation, you could say anything. You could say, we worship Muhammad, yeah! And they would all cheer as long as you say it right and you sound like you're schooling the other person and they, they'll cheer. It's uh, interesting stuff, interesting religion there. Yeah. So, uh, hmm, I'm not seeing anything. Uh, David and Al Fadi, are you getting death threats? Are you getting death threats, uh, David? Oh, yeah, all the time. I, just, I, I ignore them. I used, to, I used to put them into videos. I used to... Uh, I used to post them on Facebook. I'd, I'd take screenshots. Uh, eventually, that was one of the reasons I got off Facebook. Um, Facebook started, uh, like, penalizing me for just posting screenshots of, of someone threatening me with death, right? So they say, I'm going to kill you. Yeah, shame on you. And Why I, would, I would you post do that, it, and then, and then Facebook would say, uh, you're suspended for three days for, for posting. It's like, what? Now, that's amazing. If, 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 some, you know, if some Trump supporter said, I'm going to go kill this leftist, you're not going to get suspended for posting that, right? But if because I was posting it from a keyboard jihadi threatening to kill me, well, we have to protect that ideology, and so uh, yeah, we need to suspend yeah. David for for telling people that. But yeah, that was one of the reasons. But yeah, um, uh, there is somebody who is really insistent that we talk about the Aramaic words in the Quran. Now, uh, there there are, there are books that are written about this. Uh, there are shows that were done about this. Uh, Brother Rashid had someone who talks about this. There is a book by. Christoph Luxembourg, you know, that talks about this. So, uh, David, have you done anything about that? I mean, uh, to be honest with you, these are kind of attempts to try to show that there are some Syriac and Aramaic words that are found in the Quran, but but try to prove that, that the Quran borrowed it from there. In fact, one scholar, of uh, Islamic scholar says, any word that makes its way into the Quran becomes an Arabic word automatically. It doesn't matter what the origin is. Mm -hmm. Have you dealt with that? Yeah, so, I mean, th those are the kind of issues that, uh, honestly, I feel like, a lot of work has been done. Some people wrote books about it, articles. I mean, okay, it is what it is. Uh, we're not going to really waste our energy over that kind of stuff that is questionable. Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, Hindu historian in the super chat says, if the sun always existed eternally as part of the Trinity to be sent into creation to die for our sins, why didn't he enter creation at the time of Genesis 6? Would you call God's actions in that case uh, infinitely merciful? Um, I... I I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're talking. I don't. I don't call all of God's actions infinitely merciful. All right. Yeah, uh, sometimes, not. sometimes God. Sometimes God is 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 straight out punishing people. So no, I'm not calling that um, infinitely merciful. I say God's mercy is perfect. Right. Uh, God's love is perfect. God's mercy is perfect. God's justice is is perfect. Um, 
but no, if, if, if someone's punishing someone, you, that's, not, that's not mercy, that's, that's justice. Uh, as far as why not send Jesus then versus now, I mean, keep in mind, Jesus wasn't just coming to die. He was doing all kinds of things, right? Um, so Jesus does all kinds of things during his earthly ministry. Uh, if you look at why, I mean, we can, we, can only, we can only kind of speculate, but if you look at, if you look at Jesus' work in ministry, the idea that he's going to come, he's going to win followers, He's going to die. He's going to rise from the dead. And his followers are then going to carry on his message and spread it in the midst of persecution where people are attacking him. He was actually at the perfect time in history. That was, the, that was the perfect time in history. Alexander the Great, when he went and conquered everything, you know, from, from Europe to India, uh, established Greek as a, as a common language all the way from, from Europe to India. Now, everywhere you went, you could find Greek speakers. So if you could speak Greek, you could, you could, you could, uh, you could go speak to whoever you wanted. Um, so that had happened. And then when the Romans took over the Roman, the Roman empire, they built the most epic road system the world had ever seen. So now you can travel very rapidly and they established what's called, uh, the Roman peace, meaning before that it could be very dangerous just to, just to travel from one place to the next, to travel from one town to the next, to travel from one, uh, one country to the next. Uh, so, but the Romans established a kind of peace, meaning once you're, in, once you're inside here, it's generally pretty safe. We have soldiers, we have soldiers protecting you. And so that's when Jesus comes so that even in the midst of persecutions and people trying to crush the message and destroy it and, and persecute them, the message spread so far so fast that it just it, 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 it couldn't be stopped, right? And part of that had to do with, now you can, if, if you write your book in Greek, which the New Testament's written in, and you've got people willing to go out and share it, which they were, you could get very far, very fast. Now, if you combine that, uh, Hindu historian, if you're saying, you know, why, why then, why then? If you look, if you look at a bigger picture, you see how epic this is, right? You see how this is all part of an actual uh, brilliant plan. And it goes something like this. If you go back to the Old Testament, um, God revealed to the Jews that they were supposed to celebrate um, three festivals, right? And that, that Jews who were, who were physically and financially able were supposed to uh, go to Jerusalem for these festivals. So wherever else they spread, if they could, they were supposed to come up to Jerusalem for, and gather for these festivals. Well, what happened uh, after that was the Jews were conquered repeatedly, right? They would be conquered and deported to other areas of someone's empire, and then some of them would come back and so on. But you had Jewish, you ended up having Jewish communities that stayed in those areas. So you ended up having Jewish communities all over the world. You had Jewish communities in, in Europe. You had Jewish communities in Northern Africa. You had Jewish communities uh, in the Middle East. You had Jewish communities all over the place. And so you have these Jewish communities all over the place, but they also, the, the faithful ones also believe that when they were able, they would go to Jerusalem for the festivals. Why is all of this relevant? Well, you get to the time of Jesus. Jesus is crucified during the time of the Passover feast, where Jews would have been gathered from all over the Jewish world. So all these different countries, all these different countries, Jews would be gathered from all these different countries. So then the Jews gathered there and then they hear the news. Ah, Jesus, Jesus was killed. A guy that lots of people thought was the Messiah has been killed. That's not good for anyone who happened to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Um, so if you thought he was the Messiah, I guess pack up your bags and go home. So the, the Jews then went home after the festival. But guess what? Guess what? The seven weeks later came the next festival, the, 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 feast, the, the feast of Weeks. So Pentecost. So seven weeks later comes the next feast. That's when the Holy Spirit falls on the disciples. And we can actually read what happens here. I'll go ahead and read uh, the beginning of Acts chapter 2. Notice what happens here. So just, just to recap, you look, at, you look at history and you're wondering how all of this comes together. Well, God established that, that the Jews, the Jews, they should come up to Jerusalem for these various feasts. And then the Jews get conquered and they end up with Jewish communities all over the known world. And you ended up with Jews from all of these various countries in all these different places, speaking all these different languages, but who would still come up to Jerusalem for these festivals. Jesus is crucified. Jesus is crucified during one of those. And if they were staying a couple extra days, I mean, if, they, I mean, if they're staying for, for the rest of the Passover feast, which they would have been, they would start hearing rumors that, hey, people are saying that this guy actually rose from the dead. They're hearing that. Then they leave. Then they go home to their own countries. Well, guess what? Some of them come back. Some of them, some of them come back for the Feast of Pentecost when this happens in the book of Acts. So Acts chapter 2. 
when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Talking about the followers of Jesus. The followers of Jesus were all together in one place. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So Jesus' followers are gathered together. The Holy Spirit descends upon them. And all of a sudden they start speaking different languages. Well, guess what? There happened to be gathered there people who spoke all kinds of different languages from all these different countries where all these Jews were living now. So watch what happens. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, uh, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Now, if you look at the places these guys were from, it's from, all, it's from all over, right? You're talking Europe, you're talking Northern Africa, you're talking the Middle East, they were from all over the place. All these Jews who had come there for, for this festival, and then that's when the Holy Spirit descends on the apostles. They're filled with the Holy Spirit, and all these people who, come from, who had come from all these different nations now hear the apostles through the Holy Spirit speaking the languages of all these different people. Well, that gets their attention. They sit there, the apostle Peter speaks, gives them, presents the gospel, and you have the first mass conversion here. Tons of people convert. Here's what's interesting. Tons of people convert, and then they stay in Jerusalem to learn from the apostles. That's why you, that's why you ended up needing uh, people like Barnabas to sell property and so on. They're supporting this initial community of people who had come from all these different areas and stayed in Jerusalem to learn at the feet of the apostles because they were new Christian converts. They can't go home. They don't know anything yet. So they stay in Jerusalem, and then the Christians who had property would sell their property to support this community so these people could continue learning from the apostles. So this goes on for a while, but guess what? Then eventually a persecution breaks out. And what happens according to the book of Acts? The persecution broke out, and all these Christians went back to their homes. Now think about this. All these different people, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, because of the way this entire system was set up, because of the feasts and the way uh, uh, the, 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 the Israel, nation of Israel was conquered and people ended up in all these different countries, but then they would still come up to Jerusalem, and that's when these major events happened, Jesus' death and resurrection, and then the origin of the church, the, uh, the descent of the Holy Spirit on the original believers, and then this initial miracle of the apostles speaking in all these different languages, this getting people's attention, these people converting. Then these people spend a couple years at the feet of the apostles being supported by wealthier Christians so that they can continue learning. And then a persecution breaks out. Oh no, why would a persecution break out? All these people go back to their homelands. They just been learning for the past couple years about Christianity at the feet of the apostles themselves. And people are trying to persecute the church and stop it. And can you stop it? It spread, it, I look at that as like miraculous chain Amen. of events. That's why, that's why the most powerful empire the world had ever seen could not stop it. It spread too far, too fast, too perfectly. It couldn't stop. Now you had people in all these different countries preaching Christianity, preaching the gospel, having learned it from the feet of the apostles themselves, couldn't stop it. So Hindu historian, I hope you start, I hope you start recognizing the wisdom of God in all of this, that God knows what he's, what he's doing here. And to support what we said in Acts 8, verse 4, it says, And those who were scattered began... To share the good news. You see, God has a purpose beyond persecution. We look at the persecution as an awful thing, but we don't realize that God has a plan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Daniel George here in the super chat, and we, I think we have to wrap up because we have to actually get to the airport here. Uh, Daniel George says, uh, in Romans, in Romans, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Here all are son of God, but John 3.16 says Jesus is son of God. If everyone can be son of God, what makes Jesus special as son of God? Um, well, yeah, uh, 
Daniel, uh, I don't know what your background is if you're, you're just asking. This is kind of a version of uh, Ahmed Didat's sons by the tons objection, right? He said, oh, you, they, they say Jesus is the son of God. They say Jesus is the son of God, but you know, so what? There's, there ton, uh, God has sons by the tons in the Bible. He says sons by the tons, right? And this is just, you, you have to look at what it means, right? You have to, you have to look at what, what this means. Yes, lots of people are sons of God in the Bible, but this is used in different ways. In Acts chapter 17, when Paul says, I mean, he says to pagans, we are all his offspring, meaning we're all children of God, right? Meaning God is our source. God, God, God created us all, right? You have the nation of Israel that's called uh, the son of God, right? But that's a different sense, right? Why? Because God sort of uh, actively, uh, actively intervened in history and made, helped create the nation of Israel. You have um, in Matthew chapter 5, in, in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Well, what's it mean there? Well, there he means like if you're making peace in the world and that's what God wants you to do, then you kind of have a family resemblance with, with your father in heaven. And so, so you have different senses of the word son. When we talk about Jesus, Jesus is the unique son. Jesus is the unique son. Jesus is the eternal son. He's, he's the eternal son, right? We're sons by you know, creation or adoption. Jesus is eternal. So Jesus is in a completely different category. So wherever you're reading this, and by the way, there, there are more uses of it than, than the ones I just talked about here. Um, when you're reading these, when it says someone is the son, uh, you should think about how it's calling him the son, right? If Jesus had said, I'm a son of God, the Jews wouldn't have had any problem with that. They wouldn't have had any problem with that. When he's saying he's the son of God, they got a problem with that one. They got a problem with that one. He's clearly claiming in a unique sense. And if you read, if you read passages uh, like John chapter 5, when Jesus is claiming to be the son of God in John chapter 5, he's clearly talking about, he's clearly talking about a divine sense, right? And he's saying that everything that the Father does, I do too. Everything that, that the Father has, I have too. The, the things that the Father does, like judging the world and raising the dead, I do those things too. So here he's not just saying, hey, I'm another son of God like the rest of you. He's, I'm the son of God in the sense of I carry on my father's trade. My father is God. I'm God too. Why? Because they're eternally that way. So hope that answers uh, the question. Daniel, should we, should we wrap up now? Yes, sir. All right. Well, we have to head to the airport. Al Fadi, any final thoughts and any words? Take as, uh, take as long as you want. Uh, I just want to thank everybody, of course, for taking the time to be with us. And even some of you maybe uh, watched our uh, Facebook live stream. Please uh, remember to support our, our dear brothers, support us, support our ministries. And at the same time, make sure you take these kind of videos that we do and spread it around. We would like to broaden our reach and we cannot do it without you, of course. And, um, you know, one, one last uh, comment. A gentleman by the name John Wilson is saying, how is it like to sit right next to a <laughs> psychopath? It's very safe so far. <laughs> You're well, safe. He knows I would crush anyone who, uh, who messed with him. <laughs> well, we praise the Lord. Thank you so much for accepting me, by the way, and inviting me uh, to your channel. And I hope that I will see you soon in my channel, too. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And again, be sure to uh, subscribe to Al Fadi's channel to uh, see what we have coming up here. And uh, given the amount of content he's, he's putting together month after month, uh, you definitely want to uh, be checking that out because he has a lot of a lot of stuff going. All right, uh, just quick reminder: I got debates on Sunday, debate on Monday. Those will be on the channel Modern Day Debate. So check that out, and mark that on your calendars. Ch all right, catch you all later.